Welcome back guys, uh, we are talking about the brush up session for CSI NET exam. So quick review of lipids now. So for the lipids what we know that acetyl CoA is an important component for lipid and we know that most of the lipids they are made up with a backbone and that is the glycerol backbone. In some cases we are having you know sphingolipids or sphingolipid. In that case we have other salic acid and all these things. Now normally all the non-essential type of fatty acids can be produced from acetyl CoA. That's a fact. All the non-essential type can be produced from only acetyl CoA. But the essential types, some of them are not be produced from acetyl CoA and essential amino I mean fatty acids, all the essential fatty acids, in fact, most of them are unsaturated in nature. Now, when you talk about fatty acids, two important things always come to our mind. One is saturated fatty acid, another one is the unsaturated fatty acid. Now, unsaturated fatty acid means there are you know bonds present in between, right? So double bonds are present, kings uh, start to form, but saturated polysac uh, saturated uh, fatty acids means they won't have any double bond in between, they don't have any kink in between, so compact structure. So usually for our health, unsaturated fatty acids are good, they are good fats. Now uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids found to be more good or oligounsaturated fatty acids found to be much better for our health, they are termed as uh, UFA because polyunsaturated fatty acids polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFA, something like that. Now, usually unsaturated fatty acids, example for such an is oleate or oleic acid. Now, in this case, so what they have, they always have low melting point and that is very, very good feature. Now, normally melting point depends on the double bond that are present in between, right? And if you have double bond, that means uh, we require much more and higher energy to break those bonds as usual. Very, very uh, convenient way to think. Now the melting point can determine can be determined by the presence of cis or trans nature of the fatty acid. For example, unsaturated fatty acid can be both cis and trans. Now the trans type uh, is uh, in this case uh, having uh, you know in normally trans type is having the higher melting point. Cis type is ha uh, having lower melting point. Uh, that's the thing. Now usually the cold blooded animal in their cell membrane because cell membrane is a huge reservoir for fatty acid. So in their cells. They have more unsaturated fatty acid than saturated type and that's uh, of great importance because if they are having saturated type it will kind of you know saturated and very compact in the cold area they become more compact so the uh, cellular um, uh, membrane uh, phospholipid movement kind of halted in those situations so that's why unsaturated fat give them some room to work with. On the other hand, if we talk about the second thing, which is the physical properties of fatty acids, because you know fatty acids they're consisting of glycerol, uh, backbone, and all these things. So the properties are always depend on the length of the hydrocarbon chain that is present. Because if you uh, examine the structure of fatty acid, it's nothing but a hydrocarbon chain. Uh, carbon and hydrogen they're attached all this uh, part. So hydrocarbon chain that can be smaller, longer, depends on the type. It also depends on the degree of unsaturation because saturation will turn some important factor, uh, properties away. So unsaturation is very, very important. And branching is another important point because you've seen some of the complicated fats of our body and that is uh, due to the branching nature. Now fatty acid transport in blood and in blood fatty acids actually transported via bound to emo, uh, I mean albumin because in you know, albumin is a protein that is also found in our blood. Usually the uh, fatty acids that are being transported by other systems like chylomicron and all the stuff so I'm not going to talk but actually most of it uh, actually transported by albumin it bind, bound with albumin the increasing solubility under water if we consider the different types of fatty acids according to the role of solubility in water because you know water solubility is not possible for fat because they form micelle or uh, for that reason, normally what happens because they are amphipathic molecule, they have been polar head and non-polar tail. So in this case, according to the increasing solubility in water, we can put triacylglycerol, then diacylglycerol, then monoacylglycerol. So as we go going towards monoacylglycerol, the solubility in water increases. Now, uh, phosphatidyl, uh, choline and phosphatidyl lysine, these two things are important. Why? Because phosphatidylcholine is a neurotransmitter which is acting as in the neuromuscular junction which helps in the muscle contraction, right? And you know one example for this to block this situation is, you know, botulinum toxin due to that part, uh, usually contraction uh, can't be possible, it is halted and it causes placid paralysis. On the other hand, phosphatidylysine is a very important uh, fatty acid too because phosphatidylysine is the type which is negatively charged fatty acid. So overall charge is negative in this case. 
On the other hand, last thing we want to talk about is the saponification thing. The saponification means simply the alkaline hydrolysis of the fat. That's all uh, about the saponification. Now, what we use the alkali in this case, we use potassium hydroxide or KOH as uh, the alkali in that case to hydrolyze uh, the fatty acid there. And something is called saponification number. It is the number of milligram or the number of milligram of potassium hydroxide taken to hydrolyze one gram of fat. And this thing actually helped us to give the idea of molecular weight of a fatty acid. And that's why we are doing all this saponification stuff, right? So that's kind of it. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Oh, I forgot one thing to mention, that's why I'm again coming back. And that is about sphingolipids a little bit, because you know, there are these glycolipids that most of the part that we've talked before, but there are some lipids called sphingolipids. The sphingolipids example are sphingomyelin, uh, globocytes, and also we have a cerebrocytes. So the examples of sphingolipids, globocytes, cerebrocytes, and sphingomyelin. Good to go.